Hi again. This is a response video to Mr. Matt Quigley and for his response to my response. Now, first of all, I'd like to uh, apologise to Mr. Quigley in the fact that I did mean indeed Darwin's peppered moths and not just butterflies. Um, it's been a long time since I read it. However, it, made, it makes little difference. Um, he says it's been debunked, the story yeah, it was debunked. In fact, Darwin's observations on pepper moths showing a predominance of dark-winged varieties in times of industrial sooting came into question for the fact that the moths were not observed being eaten by birds. It was only an assumption. So in 1950s, Bernard Kettlewell did a scientific study of these moths and concluded that the moths were in fact an example of Darwinian evolution. However, when the methods of Kettlewell were brought into question, um, questions were asked and of course creationists hit on this as um, he's a man that actually lied. So in, from the year 2000 to the year 2007, Cambridge University has in fact done quite a detailed, in fact a very detailed, research once again into the peppered moths. And the conclusions that were reached were in fact that this was once again um, true. Uh, Darwin's, Darwin's theory does hold out and these moths were actually eaten by plenty of predators that they observed. Modern equipment of course does make things a little easier in this in this sort of sense so anyway um, of course your creationists did hit upon this and uh, they found it a reason for not believing in evolution and uh, as, as a debunking as it were and uh, now it's been sort of proved again so uh, the debunkings of evolution stories do seem to have a life of their own and uh, we see that there are people who just hear these stories and repeat them as if it was proof against evolution. Even when the thing has been debunked, it has a life of its own. Does that sound familiar? Anyway, um, I've had to uh, do this first part again because I got it all wrong earlier. And so the editing is a bit odd, but uh, on to the next bit. However, you go on to mock Darwin way of explaining genetics which he does by observation and not through describing say dominant uh, genes or DNA uh, this is of course because he had no concept of these things but he knew they must exist in effect he pulled off a brilliant piece of deduction um, as time in fact proved um, when of course DNA was discovered and etc Right, you're in, you're, you are correct, in fact, that the populations are not to go through a little change um, in most of their evolutionary history. Yet, when things get tough, or the going gets tough, and the environment changes, you will find these changes happening. We'll come on to that perhaps a bit later. Now, your, your list of genetic disorders is, is in fact really comical. It's, uh, it's only a list of disorders. For starters which uh, makes it quite amusing and of course if we follow your path of reasoning your god must be a real shit so uh, he must have invented that lot you know so anyway we'll go on to the next bit okay you are you ask what produces the changes and how they happen and then you show a series of dog breeds which obviously evolved through uh, unnatural selection i.e man choosing which one bred to pass on their genes and uh, you recognize the variations now on this same assumption that you make you uh, you assume that you can place say a Kodiak or grizzly bear in the Arctic and it will act exactly the same and survive the same way as a polar bear which obviously is not the case okay um, Next one. Uh, I want to get one thing clear. No being on Earth is less or more evolved than anything else. It lives for its environmental needs. 
No animal is on its way to achieve becoming something else. It's living for the moment. Okay. Now you're right. DNA does not listen to a protein that says it's cold. And your reasoning is beyond response. Uh, worthy, really, for such stupidity. DNA will pass on information and instruction from both parents and with features from each. Now, let's go on, finally, to these environmental changes that you somehow just don't seem to be able to understand. Now, I suppose you've got to think about the fact that the world isn't 6,000 years old. It's an awful lot older. And through those periods, we have had massive changes. There has been almost an completely covered in ice earth. Um, we've also had earth with uh, absolutely no ice at the poles. It's during the time of the dinosaurs and just after, much warmer then. We've also, if you see now this old thing of the moving of the continents, the tectonic plate movements. Um, obviously, you probably don't believe in that either. But uh, even in this day and age with satellite navigation, we can actually see that the world is moving around. The continents are moving. 50 million years ago, for instance, there was no Himalayas. They were, it was, you know, a molehill, more or less. It's the pushing of the continent of India into Asia that caused the Himalayas to rise. Now, that in itself has caused a major change in the world's weather. If you go back even further, um, you will find that nearly all the land mass of the Earth was in the Southern Hemisphere, all in one gigantic mass. This actually slowed down the conveyor, conveyor effect of ice at both poles, the, the warm water and air of the equator, pulling down through the continents, etc. You can look it up yourself. But it's a major change to the weather. Africa, for instance, uh, in the Sahara, it was once underwater. Uh, there, there's plenty of signs of sea life in the Sahara Desert, for instance. And also much of Africa was once completely wooded. Uh, now, of course, it's mainly savannah. Now, these are massive changes, changes that made a big difference in life. Lots of things have gone extinct, but many animals have continued by adaptation to the environment. And if you cannot understand that, well, you're not really worth talking to anyway. I think that uh, really you've got to start to learn something else. Um, I'm sorry it conflicts with your Bible. I really am, because that's really what it's down to, isn't it? That when we find something that is true, that conflicts with something which cannot be said to be not true, then you use the word faith. Now, faith basically means not true uh, when it's taken in a religious concept, because there is no proof of it, whereas there's proof of something else which is true. Now, that'll do. I'm fed up with you, to be honest. Peace.